So what I'd like to talk about today is a, a very uh, complicated subject, um, which uh, we, we constantly try to make simple. And every time we make it simple, we mess it up even more. Uh, because uh, this subject of healthcare is not a sound bite. Uh, there is no silver bullet. Um, um, and uh, if we're going to really attack uh, the question of healthcare, and if we're going to be su successful in addressing the question of healthcare, I think we actually have, have to have a fairly deep <coughs> understanding of the problem. And so what I'm going to try to do today, which is not a good idea because it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday, I'm going to try to give you a really deep understanding of the problem. And uh, I'm going to talk too fast, uh, but I'm going to show you a bunch of slides. These slides will post and make available to anybody who's interested. I, I'm going to get to public policy because I know everybody here likes public policy, uh, but I'm going to get there slowly. Because I think unless we understand the actual nitty gritty of healthcare delivery, um, and what the real problem is, uh, we, can, we get our public policy wrong. So I'm going to overweight the what's going on here and how do we think about it, and, and we'll talk a little bit about policy at the end. I'm going to work to the best of my ability to leave plenty of time at the end for discussion. Uh, we are, in fact, a little bit programmed about how much we talk. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best to violate you know, that, that, that programming a little bit. Uh, but I, I do want to give you a, a serious uh, discussion here. And I, and I hope this is not too heavy uh, for this case. But uh, I, I, the, one of the reasons I, I wanted to come today is because all of you actually can do something about this in one way or another. Uh, there's some people in, the, in this audience that work in healthcare. Obviously, you have the most direct impact, but almost all of us has some levers that we can use to, to influence this, and uh, so hopefully you will. So, what's the problem of healthcare? Uh, I mean, the first part of the problem of healthcare is to get access coverage, and uh, uh, obviously, without people getting access to care, without coverage, uh, ultimately we'll never have a successful system. Um, but what I've been focusing on is uh, not the access problem, um, uh, because I think we understand the access problem pretty well. And some, many countries have solved the access problem. Uh, what I've been working on is really, the, I think, the more basic problem, and that's the delivery problem. Uh, the way we actually deliver health care. Access is not the goal of health care. Access is just the start of the real goal, which is uh, to deliver good care. Uh, and uh, in fact, I would say that the, the real goal of healthcare is value. How, how do we actually deliver good value? How do we actually get good patient outcomes uh, per dollar we spend in uh, trying to achieve those outcomes? Um, and and w what I'd like to uh, argue is that we really haven't thought about value as the central goal in healthcare. Uh, it's not been the goal that's united all of us uh, and all the actors in the system, and it must. Um, and we've not got a healthcare system that's designed to deliver value. In fact, quite the contrary. Um, I, I, I would say that I'm extremely optimistic about the ability to make epic improvements in healthcare delivery. Uh, but if we're going to do that, we're going to have to think very differently about, about the problem, or we're going to have to think very differently about the solutions. Um, and that's what I'd like to do today. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, how would we actually create a high value healthcare delivery system? How would we actually create a system that could relentlessly, rapidly improve value? Uh, that's the real question I think we have to answer. And if we can understand that, if we can understand what kind of healthcare delivery system we want, uh, then we can start to set the right public policies that are going to get us uh, in the right direction. So how do we think about uh, value? How do we think about the, the goal of, of, of creating value in the healthcare delivery system? Well, I think the, the first conclusion that I reached, and this was now quite some years ago after the first uh, wave of work in, in healthcare. This is very echoey to me. Is it echoey to you? No. No? Good. OK. Well, I'll, 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 I'll suck it up and go ahead. <laughs> um, so uh, what I realized was that if we're going to create a high value system, uh, we can't do it incrementally. This is a very, very tough thing to have to say. Uh, uh, if we make incremental improvement, but we don't attack the actual underlying structure of the system that we have today, I've come to believe that we will never be very happy with the results. Because the healthcare delivery system that we have today is a system that's been built up over a long period. There's a legacy here. 
And the way hospitals look and the way doctors practice medicine and the way nurses and, and teams provide care, that, that, there's a legacy structure. And that structure, I think, is deeply flawed. Now, we can make things better with incremental improvement. For example, let's take an example of safety. In this very building, Don Berwick used to, you know, used to have his office here. And he's been raising the issue of safety, medical errors. And we can indeed introduce safety programs into healthcare delivery organizations. And if we do, that will make things better. Uh, but unfortunately, if we don't change the structure of the delivery system, uh, we won't be able to move it very far. Let's take another example. Let's take process guidelines or, or pathways <coughs> of care. A lot of focus in healthcare about designing protocols and pathways uh, to deliver care for given medical problems uh, better. And, and many organizations de design these protocols and design these pathways. But if we leave the structure the same, if we, if we have a structure that, that, that is dysfunctional, it's very hard for actually those pathways to be implemented. Even if we got the right pathway, it doesn't actually get used in practice. So the point here is that we've got to step back. We can't assume that, uh, that, that, that the problem here is one that we can solve incrementally. We've got to step back and ask ourselves uh, much more basic questions about the underlying structure of the system. And that's what we've been trying to do in, in this body of work. I guess the final sort of framing question here is what should the role of the market be in healthcare? Uh, this is, of course, a fiercely debated issue all around the world. Some people think, oh, there's no room for the market in healthcare. Other people think the market's the only way to save healthcare. And, of course, this is an, an issue of great uh, interest to me because I'm a strategy professor. You know, I do markets. And, uh, um, but what I've come to understand is the problem is not whether we use the market or not. Uh, in fact, I think, in general, we would want to use the market. The market means people have choice. And I think most people would agree that patients should have choice. And if patients have choice, there's a market mechanism underway. Uh, but the problem, the, the, the problem we've had in healthcare is not whether we have the market or not. It's how the market has been constructed. And the unfortunate problem we have right now, particularly in the US, is that the way the market works is actually not aligned with value for the patient. The competition is one where financial success for the various participants of the system is not equal to patient success. You can have system participants succeed without the patient succeeding. And in that situation, we, 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 the market starts to make things worse and not better. And that's the fix that we're in in healthcare. The market has been actually working against us in terms of value improvement because people aren't rewarded for value improvement. The market has been leading mostly to zero-sum competition, where we're essentially trying to you know, take value from one party to another or pass cost onto the consumer rather than actually improve the overall value created. So once again, everything comes back to value. How do we design a healthcare delivery system? And how do we design competition so that it's actually aligned with the fundamental purpose of healthcare, which is deliver good value? Uh, deliver good outcomes and, and do it as efficiently as possible. And efficiency is important so we can afford to do more. Uh, so we can afford to serve everybody. So we can afford to uh, do, deal with new technology. As new technology comes in the system, we can't be afraid of it. We have to embrace it so that we can provide more services for more problems. Uh, but unless we can deliver value, we're not going to be able to afford to do that. We're going to be pushed back into rationing and, uh, and, and bankruptcy, frankly. Uh, which is the kind of precipice we're on today. Um, the health care reform bill worked on the access part. It pretty much punted completely on the delivery part. So now we have a pressing, fundamental challenge, which is how to transform the delivery system and how to do it in the right way so the way we transform it uh, improves value. So how do we do that? How do we think about that? Well, first of all, we've all got to agree that value is the goal. And there's been a lot of different goals in healthcare: access, equity, uh, cost containment. Um, and that last one, cost containment, that's the worst goal of all. What I've found is that that goal 
is actually counterproductive. That is, the more we try to view cost containment as the goal, the more we actually drive costs up. And we'll talk about why uh, a little bit uh, as, as we go forward. Uh, value has got to be the fundamental goal. Value is what ultimately the purpose of healthcare is. It's, it's to deliver uh, good outcomes to patients. Value is a win-win goal. If we can increase value, if we can improve outcomes per dollar spent, obviously the patient benefits, the payer, the government benefits, the provider who does a good job uh, benefits, uh, everybody benefits. The problem right now is that we have sort of a zero-sum way of, 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 of sort of defining the goal. And we have all these stakeholders gaming the system, trying to protect their interests. So the doctors are trying to protect their interests, and the health plans are trying to bargain with them and uh, you know, pull, protect their interests. And everybody's protecting their interests rather than working collaboratively on what we ultimately need to do, which is to, is to expand the overall uh, value uh, of the system. Uh, so value has got to be that central goal. Now let's think about value. Value has, is an equation. It has a numerator and a denominator. The numerator is health outcomes. What do we mean by a health outcome? A health outcome is the results of care, how well the patient actually does. What we know about outcomes is there's always multiple outcomes for any medical problem. Uh, there's survival uh, is, a, is an outcome we often measure because it's certainly relevant. Uh, you know, but there's many other outcomes. How functional is the patient? Uh, uh, there, uh, how arduous and protracted was the care delivery process? That, that's an outcome. Uh, if we have a patient that has to be debilitated for six months in order to get cured, that's certainly a lot worse outcome than if a patient gets, can, can, can do outpatient care and, and continue to work while getting treatment. And then there's another part of outcomes which has to do with what we call the sustainability of health. That is, how long does whatever you did actually persist in terms of keeping you healthy? Uh, so when we think about outcomes, we can't think about one narrow outcome, that there's one outcome. Uh, economists like to try to collapse all the outcomes of healthcare into one number. Uh, that's a mistake. Never work, impossible, dead end, blind out. Uh, that's, we've got to understand that outcomes are inherently multidimensional. Different patients will actually have different values about which outcomes matter the most to them. Uh, and we've got to allow those choices to be made. Uh, outcomes are revealed over time. We don't want to measure the outcome of a surgery 30 days after the surgery. We want to measure the outcome of a care process over the, proce over the time period by which the care process emerges in terms of the results that it achieves. So when we think about outcomes, uh, this is, these are some of the concepts that I'm going to build on a little bit later. Uh, on the, d the denominator of the uh, value equation is cost. How do we think about cost? Well, what we care about is the total cost of all the services involved in providing the care for the patient's medical problem, whatever it is, breast cancer, diabetes, uh, uh, and, and sometimes it isn't a problem, like pregnancy and childbirth. That's not a problem, but it's a, it's a care cycle. And when we measure cost, we want to add up all the costs in the care cycle. Now, the mistake we tend to make is we tend to focus on the cost of each individual intervention or service in the care cycle. And we try to control that cost by, you know, by squeezing down the reimbursement you know, to the physician a little bit. Or, uh, by figuring out which are the high cost services and trying to limit those high cost services. Uh, we've got kind of a battle going on between Medicare and you know, the provider community about limiting high cost services. Right now, they've really got the imaging thing you know, as a bee in their bonnet. You know, they, they don't like the idea there's so many images. And they may be right, but, but that's the wrong way to think about cost. The right way to think about cost is the total cost of the full cycle of care. And what we may very well want to do is spend more on some of the things in that care cycle, and we might want to spend less or may even eliminate other things in that care cycle. But we won't understand costs unless we think about it that way. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. I've come to realize, and this is something that, you know, really over the last year I've, I've come to realize it, is that we actually, people in healthcare, and this is no disrespect, people in healthcare literally don't understand costs. Can you imagine that? We've been having a 20-year discussion on costs in healthcare, 
And yet if you ask a healthcare organization, what is the total cost of dealing with Mrs. Jones's breast cancer? Not a single healthcare organization in the world can answer that question. Because the cost accounting systems have been misaligned with the way to think about cost from a value perspective. And, and, and what we'll see later on is the way they, uh, healthcare organizations think about costs is the same way they think about outcomes, it's the same way they think about billing, which is siloed. Siloed around specialties and interventions. So uh, well, the value equation is a very important uh, bedrock of what we need to understand and master. Uh, and, and these are some of the kind of critical points uh, that, that we need to understand as, as we go forward. Now, what we see over and over again is that there's often a relationship between value, outcomes, and cost. And this is a slide with Swedish data. Uh, as some of you know, the Swedish system is organized by county. Uh, and this looks at the cost of health care in a series of counties, Swedish counties, and the uh, quality of health care. Um, and this quality, by the way, is adjusted, as is the cost in very sophisticated ways to account for differences in the patient population, you know, age and morbidity and all those things. So what do you think the relationship between outcomes and cost is? Now the first order thinking in healthcare is, oh my god, it costs more to get good outcomes. And the truth is that it costs less to get good outcomes. If you get good outcomes, that's actually the way to drive cost. Why is that? Because actually what truly determines cost in healthcare is how unhealthy you are. And the, the faster you can get people to health and the longer you can preserve that health, uh, the lower the cost system is. The only way to really reduce cost in healthcare is to make people more healthy. Um, and you make people more healthy by doing things like this. By, by getting the right drug to the right patient. By doing the treatment in a timely way so you don't have to interrupt it. Uh, by using a less invasive process that requires less recovery time and days in the hospital, by making fewer mistakes, by uh, having less disability at the end of the uh, end of the care process. But of course, all these things, which are wonderful outcomes for patients, lower cost. And so, what we find is that in the value equation, the real leverage is on the numerator, driving the numerator. Now, for sure, we can do some things on the denominator, but it's really driving that numerator that's important. But guess what? We don't know what the numerator is because we don't measure. We don't measure outcomes. Almost never. So we'll, we'll talk about why, and we'll talk about what, what, the, what the opportunities we have there are. But, uh, but again, if you think at the very highest level, uh, and if you kind of get these basic concepts, it starts to tell you what's our policy agenda. You know, in the seven million page healthcare bill, there was one page about outcomes. One page, and you know how that page got there? I'll take some credit for that. I happened to know Senator Jeff Bingaman from New Mexico, and I ran into him in the airport. And I said, Senator, there's nothing in this bill about outcomes. And he said, okay, Mike, let's come up with something. <laughs> so we got, we got it into the bill, you know? But it's, 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 the, it's the end footnote on the last page. And yet, any clear thinking about the problem of healthcare delivery says that that's our most important single lever, is actually measuring the results. Um, and there's lots of reasons why it's hard to do, and I'll get to those, but, but, but again, just uh, these are some of the big messages I, I, I want you to take away, uh, at least from the work that, that we've done. So what do we need to do? Well, we've come to the conclusion um, based on not only the work, the work published in the book, but all the subsequent work over the last four years, that there are six fundamental strategic agendas to reform healthcare delivery. I put aside the insurance issues, not because they're unimportant, but because we're talking about delivery today. Um, number one, we've got to reorganize the care delivery structure and process. Uh, and we'll talk about how. And that's not only for specialty care, like cancer care, but it's also for primary and preventative care. We've got a structure now that is mission impossible. That is, we've put our medical professionals in a structure that it's almost impossible, if not impossible, to deliver good value. They can sometimes get good outcomes, but they have to do so very expensively, uh, and they often don't get as good outcomes as we would like. 
So that's, that's agenda number one. Agenda number two is we have to uh, establish universal measurement of outcomes and cost in the system for every patient. Uh, and that's in the line of care. Not, not retrospective studies, not cost effectiveness uh, studies. Those, those are good, we like those, but, but, but we, we've got to start to make a measurement of outcomes and cost really integral to the whole care delivery process. And to how we, uh, and, and this is obviously is a big area for public policy. We'll talk about this a little bit later. Number three, we have to change the reimbursement model. And um, there's really uh, only one reimbursement model, at least according to me, uh, that makes sense from a value perspective. There's lots of reimbursement models that you can make an argument for from a cost perspective or a simplicity perspective. But from a value perspective, the only reimbursement model that makes sense is to pay a packaged or bundled price for the care of a particular medical condition or for the primary care of a particular patient population. And we'll talk about that later and why that's the right reimbursement model. Uh, we all know that fee-for-service is not right, but now we're toying with this idea of global capitation again. Global capitation means that you provide, you pay a provider about amount of money, and that provider will take care of any medical problem that might arise. That's a very big mistake. Because that breaks the connection between what the provider can actually organize and control and the payment mechanism. It puts the provider into the insurance business in a way that we really don't want. It also leads to consolidation and monopolization in the delivery network. And, and so we don't want global capitation. We desperately don't want it. Unfortunately, our commission here in Massachusetts uh, recommended it for Massachusetts. I was horrified. But you know, since, until the election is resolved, I, I'm not going to worry too much uh, because I'm not sure what's going to go forward. But, well, we, we have to get the right reimbursement model. And we've got to make sure that the way we reimburse is aligned with creating value for the patient. We want people that create value to feel good about the reimbursement, to feel motivated by it. We want people that don't uh, deliver value to be somewhat disadvantaged and, and, and penalized by it. Uh, so we'll talk about that a, a little bit later. Uh, number four, we have to tie together the facilities and institutions in our delivery system, particularly those within the same organization. I mean, we all here in Massachusetts, we're, we know this, this thing called Partners Healthcare. And Partners is a, 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 a multi-hospital system, Mass General, Brigham, Newton Wellesley, you know, and uh, Faulkner and other hospitals. And there's these outpatient facilities in various parts of, of, of the greater New England or Boston area. Well, guess what? Each of those hospitals is a standalone, unique organization. There's no connection between them. Uh, there's very little connection between the outpatient facilities and the inpatient facilities. And that's the way healthcare has been structured. We've got a lot of standalone institutions that kind of do their thing. Uh, and they're not connected with other institutions, even if they're five minutes away, 10 minutes away, 20 minutes away. And, and worse yet, all of those organizations try to do everything. They try to provide every service. Because we've gotten it into our head that what you should do if you're a hospital is you should provide for any service that anybody walking in the door will need. And that's never going to work. We're never going to deliver value that way, uh, particularly in, a, in an urban area uh, where there's lots of other institutions present. So we'll talk about that. Uh, the fifth thing we have to do is we have to break down the very narrow geographic boundaries of the way we're thinking about healthcare delivery. Right now, uh, healthcare delivery organizations uh, with literally zero exceptions, serve the vast majority of the patients they serve or in their immediate geographic area. Uh, and that's because the way that that's the way the system was created. Every community, every city has its hospitals. Every community has its community hospitals. Uh, the community hospital serves the patients in that community. The one in this uh, community serves the patients in that community. We have this kind of uh, s sort of isolated, geographic isolated organizations. Why should we have every one of those organizations try to provide care for everything? Why don't the organizations that are really excellent actually provide care for what they're really excellent at in multiple geographies? Why shouldn't we be able to get Cleveland Clinic quality heart care in Des Moines? 
why shouldn't the Cleveland Clinic be actually managing heart care in Des Moines? These are questions, again, that the healthcare system has been even incapable of asking, much less answering. But this is starting to rapidly change, and, and, I'll, and I'll show you why in a minute. And, and the final agenda is the one that I'll probably talk least about, which is the area of IT. Uh, what do we know about IT? We know that in IT, if you automate a broken system, you get a more efficient broken system. So IT is not about putting online and making electronic what we do today. IT is about keep putting the platform in place that allows us to do one through five. And so what we'll talk about is what are the imperatives for IT in order to do that, okay? These are the six strategic agendas. These are the things that we have to get done if we're gonna ever succeed. Uh, these are the things that government policy needs to enable, needs to enable. Okay, and so when we come back to government policy, uh, we'll, we'll be answered uh, to these agendas. Now, let's talk briefly about uh, these agendas. I want to spend most of my time on one, uh, a little bit of time on two, uh, a touch on three. I'll probably go very quickly from there on, just given the time. But I, but but the reason I'm going to spend the time on one is this is the guts of the issue. This is the coal face. You know, this is this is how caregivers. <laughs> engage with patients and actually deliver care. And this is actually the core of the problem. And these other things simply help uh, equip and enable and measure and reward people so that they do number one the right way. Okay, so let's talk about number one. Now, how is care currently delivered? Well, basically, uh, uh, it's delivered uh, pretty much the way you see here on the left. And the example I'm gonna use is migraine care. Uh, it's, a, it's a disease that all of us kind of intuitively understand. Uh, migraine is, uh, uh, you know, affects a lot of people, uh, a little bit more weighted towards women. Um, complex disease uh, uh, to treat, uh, lots of uh, nuance and variation of the disease. Um, this example I'm actually going to use is from Germany. Uh, we have a case study that we teach uh, in my uh, intensive course on healthcare delivery uh, on the German migraine. Uh, uh, problem and uh, uh, in Germany they were very, they they did some work on migraine and, and, and the results were horrible. were horrible they were getting bad outcomes lots of patients having to go to the emergency room lots of times going back to the doctor because things weren't going well uh, taking days off of work because the, these headaches can be completely debilitating I mean you literally can't even stand up um, bad outcomes. Uh, and, 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 a, and, a, and some leaders in Germany started thinking, what's going on here? What can we do about it? But, but let me not get ahead of the story. Uh, the left hand side is the traditional care delivery model. It's organized around specialties and around services, discrete services. Okay? So if you go into a hospital and you walk down the hall, you'll everywhere in the world. You'll see, you know, Department of Neurology, Department of Urology, Department of Surgery, De General Surgery, Department of Medical Oncology, Department of Radiation Oncology, Department of this, Department of that, Pathology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the other doors you walk by will be doors that are just, that they're providing a particular intervention or a particular service, uh, like an imaging, an imaging suite where you'll, you'll go for your ultrasound or for your MRI or whatever it is. Okay? We're organized around the services and around the specialties. And, and that's the, the bubbles here are, are those units in migraine. Uh, if you have a migraine, I tend to start with a primary care physician. My God, I have these headaches. They're really bad. You know, need some help. Uh, your primary care physician, and this is in case of Germany, do their best. Listen to you, examine you, uh, and they may be able to deal with the problem. Um, if they do, fine, you're, you're done. Uh, if, if they don't, then probably the next thing you would do is end up at an outpatient neurologist. Neurology is the folks that worry about you know, heads and thinking and brains and headaches and things like that. Um, uh, then um, the, if, you, if you end up at an outpatient neurologist, depending on the way you uh, present, uh, you might end up getting a scan. Um, and you'll go to an imaging center. Um, you might end up somewhere along the line at a physical therapist because there's a lot of evidence that physical therapy is, can be helpful in controlling and managing uh, migraines. You might end up the psychologist for the same reason. 
Uh, if what your mi if, if what is determined is your migraines are because of drug dependency, which is sometimes the case, you might end up having to spend a week in the hospital, uh, getting detoxified uh, from drug dependency. There's a vari variety of other things. So I've simplified it a little bit. Um, what's the nature of the process? The patient goes. Think think of the patient as a ping pong ball. And think of these as kind of ponging, you know, places. And so the patient kind of pongs around this system. Okay? And, and, and by the way, there, there can be feedback loops, and the patient can come back and forth and back and forth. So I could have drawn, like, lots of lines. I could have made it like spaghetti. Okay? What is the nature of this process from a value point of view? Number one, it's a sequential process. You do one thing at a time, you do one thing, then you wait, then you do the next thing, then you wait, then you do the next thing, then you wait. Um, that doesn't sound good from a value perspective, does it? Uh, what we would hope would, have, would be a parallel process, where you do the stuff that you can do at the same time at the same time. Um, the second thing about this process is each step in this process has a separate administrative interaction. You have to make a call. You have to figure out where to go, make a call, get an appointment, schedule the appointment, uh, show up, sit in the waiting room, fill out your clipboard. You know, Every single time you go to any one of those things. Even if you've been to that particular one before, you still have to go through it again. Now, we complain a lot about the health plans as the problem in administrative costs in healthcare. Let me tell you, it's not the health plans. It's this. The reason we have high uh, 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 administrative costs in healthcare is because of the structure of the system. Because we have all these many interactions. And by the way, each of these bubbles sends a bill, a separate bill. Okay, That's the driver of the administrative costs. And we waste a lot of time and a lot of money because we do it this way. Um, the third thing about this, uh, uh, this care delivery process that makes my physician friends a little bit uncomfortable is that it's not provided by a team. It's provided by a bunch of individuals who only dimly, if at all, work together and know each other. In fact, the way, my analogy is this is like a pickup team when I was a kid, I used to play a lot of baseball. I would go down to the playground. Uh, I would have my bat. I'd have my ball. I'd see who was around. And if Bill George was there, I'd say, Bill, you'd be a great pitcher today. And I'll be the catcher, and Jane will be the left fielder. And you know, Who you actually get care for you it's, is not a team. It's whoever's on the schedule. It, it's whoever has the open appointment. It's whoever you heard about you know, from your friend. It's whoever your PCP actually might have you know, heard of before. Okay? Does that mean that these people aren't well trained? No. Does it mean that they don't care? No. Does it mean that you might not get good care? Not necessarily. But it's, it's kind of random. Uh, who actually sees you? Now, by the way, the neurologist that sees you, he, he or she has a neurology hat on. And the way the system works today is neurologists deal with anything in neurology. And that's the, that's the way they define their job. Now, neurology encompasses stroke. It encompasses multiple sclerosis, uh, et cetera. Okay? So the, the patient that came in before your, you, you, the migraine patient, was maybe a stroke patient. And then the one after you was a, a multiple sclerosis patient. And the neurologist is saying, I'm a neurologist. That's my hammer. You know. I know how to use the neurology hammer. And, and <laughs> I shouldn't use the hammer. That's, that's my, uh, <laughs> the image of pounding on your head. It's not, it's not the one I had in mind. And, and then you get the idea. Uh, so the neurologist is kind of flipping back and forth between all these kind of diseases, all of which is really complicated. But, and they're trying to figure out you know, Emma, Emma Stanton's problem. Uh, just after they've tried to figure out you know, somebody else's problem with a completely different problem. Okay, that's the way the system is today. The final thing I'd say about this is there's a lot of coordination required. If you're going to put all the actors in separate units, then if, if they get any hope of an integrated solution, people have to coordinate a lot. And I just put a few of the, of the lines up, but it's really more. Okay? So does that coordination happen? Well, 
I can tell you that most people try to coordinate a little bit the best they can, but coordination in this model is very, very expensive. You have to try to page somebody, find them. It's impossible to meet. Um, you know, you write these notes, so the doctors write these notes to each other, and everybody's reading notes, but the notes are notes. I mean, they're, you know, they're, not, they're not people talking and exchanging subtle you know, information. Uh, so basically, the coordination isn't very good. Um, I, I, let me just, at this moment, let me insert a point. Right now, there's this key idea of a medical home. And the, the core idea of a medical home is, is to have a care coordinator. Now, is a care coordinator going to solve the problem? Might make it a little better. Care coordinators are a perfect example of an incremental solution. The real problem of coordination is the structure. You might be able to make it a little better with a care coordinator, but you're not going to anywhere near solve the problem if you leave everything the way it is. If the neurologist is still in a different building than the, than the, than the, uh, than, than the other professionals, and if they're all busy doing other things, you know, care coordinator is just going to be cleaning up the mess rather than delivering something excellent. So uh, this is an excellent example of why we have to tackle the structure. Now, what did we do about this? Well, here's what the Germans did. Terribly simple, obvious solution. They created something called the West German Headache Center. Really a great you know, marketing slogan, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but they created it, OK? So what did they do? It, they put these, the skills necessary to deal with this particular medical condition in the same organization, in the same space, in the same building, in the same suite. And these people here are d d dedicated themselves you know two three four days a week to the care of migraine okay so everybody working in that middle box is basically an expert on this disease okay and the idea is that if your primary care physician can't solve the problem rather than referring you randomly through this odyssey uh, they say, okay, let's refer the patient to the West German Headache Center. Uh, and the West German Headache Center does parallel processing. You deal with one administrative interaction, only one. Only one place that you talk to. They set up everything. They coordinate it. Uh, you do multitasking as you, as you go through the care delivery process. They make a very quick determination about whether you need any of the other bubbles. If you do, within a day or two, you, there's, a, there's a sort of a one-day a care model, and then there's sort of a three-day care model, and depending on the severity of your disease, you might go to a three-day care model. You come back the next day, you have a series of exercise therapy sessions, uh, you know, coaching from the psychologist, uh, group group sessions with other migraine patients. This the, this model aggregates a lot of migraine patients, and so you, if you're sitting around talking to 12 migraine patients about you know how to control the disease, they talk to each other, and good things happen. Now, this headache center is not completely self-contained. They don't have an imaging unit inside the center. They don't have an inpatient unit. But what you see they've done is they've created affiliations to do all the things that they can't handle inside. So you don't go to the random imaging center that may have done a head scan four years ago, but most of the time does you know, broken bones. You go to an imaging center that has dedicated itself to being good at looking at these particular kinds of scans. And, and they have relationships with the people in the, in the headache center. Uh, and they do, they do a much better job. And, and so the philosophy here is, instead of organizing around the supply or around the services, this, and this is such a blinding insight, organize around the patient. Oh my god. But that's not the way healthcare is organized. How can we deliver value if we have that structure on the left? How, how can even the most dedicated and skilled physician do a really great job if they're trying to deal with 75 things at a time, and if they don't get to work with a team of other people who they can uh, uh, be, be a team with? 
And if they can't accept the full responsibility for the care. See, in that model on the left, nobody accepts responsibility for anything except what they do. When they're done with the rehab session, they're done. But whereas in this model, these people have joint responsibility for the patient success. Okay? Fundamental problem in healthcare sounds, I know you're going to be maybe skeptical that it's this basic, but the fundamental problem is we got to move from the left to the right. There's always going to be patients that are very unusual, that have funny, funny combinations of things, but that's going to be a small percentage. In healthcare, we've been organizing around the exception. We've been sort of keeping our options open, keeping all the services separate. We need to start organizing around the rule. And if you're a breast cancer patient, the rule is that you're going to need a certain set of expertise, you're going to go through a, uh, a certain kind of care process, and we want to put in the same organization all the, the, the facilities and the skills and the expertise you need for that. And then we'll have another organization dedicated to uh, you know, congestive heart failure and, 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 and related conditions. And we'll have another organization dedicated to other conditions. Um, and the more prevalent a disease is, the more of these organizations we can have. Uh, and the rarer the disease is, there may only be two or three places, literally in the United States, where we can actually provide uh, world-class care. Uh, and so there, you're going to have a few centers with a lot of affiliations so that they, people can get uh, 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 good local care but, but connected to the real uh, expertise. This is the fundamental organizational problem of healthcare. In healthcare delivery, there's something called a cycle of care. This is breast cancer. It's very complicated, this healthcare delivery stuff. These are the sort of interventions and, and, and services required in, in this sort of cycle of care for a, a breast cancer patient. It often stretches over you know, 6, 12, 18 months, depending on the particular situation uh, and you know, how, much, how many therapies have to be implemented and so forth. Um, what, right now, we organize around each bubble, each slice, each dot. Uh, what we need to start to do is organize around the whole care cycle. We optimize the parts. We need to start optimizing the whole. Uh, and we haven't thought that way. Uh, and the system hasn't been structured that way uh, for a lot of historical reasons. One of the most important reasons is doctors are not trained this way. Nobody's trained to be a breast cancer. I'm responsible for breast cancer doctor. People are trained as a surgeon. They're trained as an oncologist. They're trained as a radi radiation therapist or a radiation diagnostician. Uh, they, and, and so the way we organize today is the way we're trained. The way we organize today is also the way we're paid. We're, we're paid you know, for those individual services, so it seems logical to organize around the way we pay. Uh, but of course, that's wrong because that's orthogonal with value. You know, if we didn't have so many brilliant people in medicine, we'd be in big trouble because we make it hard for them to succeed. We make it hard for them to deliver value. And we make it really hard, if not impossible, to do it efficiently. And uh, we got to change that. And until we change that, we're just going to be fighting a rear guard action you know, uh, that uh, will ultimately be hard to win. Now, on primary care, I, I don't have much time to talk about this. In fact, I have almost zero time. But, but in primary care, again, we have a structure that's mission impossible. Typical primary care physician has a panel of 1,500 patients, maybe more, with every conceivable medical problem. And we expect them with one office, one team, to provide care to Mrs. Jones, who's disabled, and Mr. Smith, who has cancer and another terrible problem, and a healthy adult, all in the same structure. It won't work. The key idea in primary care is we've got to start organizing primary care around specific patient populations. And in a primary care practice that's big enough, we need separate teams. And the folks that have heart, tough chronic diseases should be in the chronic disease team, and the elderly disabled should be in the elderly disabled team, and the healthy adults should be in the healthy adult team. And those teams will be different. They'll have different people, different skills, different protocols, different ways of delivering service. That's the direction we have to move in in primary care. Uh, again, just putting a care coordinator in a primary care department is not going to really solve the problem. We've got to be more focused, more segmented uh, if we're going to do this well. Now, then we confront the next issue. And the next issue is volume. 
Uh, now, I know I'm now instantly sounding again like a Harvard Business School professor. But um, the problem we have in healthcare is unless you have a certain minimum quantity of patients with a particular problem, you can't actually organize properly. You need enough patients to have a dedicated team. Now, by the way, dedicated teams don't have to be full-time dedicated, but at least you have to dedicate a couple of days a week you know, to a certain problem that you're going to be part of that team. Uh, and if you only have a few patients, you can't afford to do that. Everybody has to be a generalist. Everybody has to, the, every neurologist has to do everything in neurology. Every orthopedic surgeon has to do every kind of orthopedic surgery operation. Uh, so you need some volume. You need some volume to have dedicated facilities for this, to this patient group. Uh, you need volume to be uh, able to do these other things. But the way the healthcare delivery system is organized, literally in every country in the world, is really anti-volume. Uh, this is some data from Sweden. Uh, and, by, and by the way, if I haven't already said it, these delivery problems I'm discussing, they're universal. They're global. They exist everywhere, every country. And I know that now with some confidence because I've worked in probably six or seven at, at, at some deep level of uh, engagement. Um, this is Sweden. Sweden is nirvana in insurance. Everybody's covered. But in delivery, uh, there's a lot of issues in Sweden, and they know it. Um, and, and here's a good example. I mean, we have about 80 hospitals in, in Sweden. Um, and, um, um, uh, and if you go to the far right, for these relatively common medical problems. This is the number of patients in a week that the average hospital sees. So the top one is uh, really a total knee replacement. That's what that is. Um, so the average Swedish hospital does one total knee replacement per week. And I can tell you that if you're doing one a week, there's no way you can deliver value. A, a good orthopedic surgeon in the most productive environment should be able to do eight total knee replacements per day. Okay, um, But if you're doing one a week, what are you doing the rest of the week? A little bit of everything. Some hips, some knees, some shoulders, some backs. Um, and each time you're putting together a new pickup team to kind of figure it out. Uh, in in an in a, in a, in a integrated uh, uh, total joint uh, operation, uh, a team, uh, nobody has to talk in the operating room. Everybody knows what to do. I actually had a, a total hip uh, about a year ago, and uh, it took 48 minutes. You're too young to know what a total hip is. This is like sawing off bones and drilling, and ugh, it's awful. 48 minutes, no blood loss. And that's because this was a team. They did a lot of these things. Everybody on there knew everything about what to do every minute of the, every minute of the process. They knew all the complications before they started. They knew all the things that, that a patient would ask before they asked them. Uh, the nurse could do the rehab. The rehab people could be the nurses. It was all a team. Uh, but that's not the way the system is structured because every hospital wants to do everything, tries to do everything, partly because we have this local model where we think that we should go to the closest local hospital, uh, even if it would only take 10 minutes or 20 minutes to get to another one. And in some cases, by the way, we may want to get on the airplane. Uh, one of the reasons we haven't gotten on the airplane in the past is because it sort of uh, we just haven't, haven't, haven't thought about it, but one of the reasons we haven't gone on the airplane is traditionally when there was less technology and it was less complicated, there was less medical knowledge, a given doctor could do any kind of orthopedic operation and do it well. Uh, but now, as we've gotten better and better, as the technology has improved and improved, now we've just gone beyond the capacity of everybody to be a total generalist in their field uh, but yet we haven't changed the organizational structure. Also, traditionally, uh, when there wasn't that much that could be done, people sat in the hospital for a long time. Seven-day hospital stay, 15-day hospital stay was not at all uh, exceptional. Uh, if you're going to be in the hospital for two weeks, you want it to be near your house, because you know, otherwise, how are you going to see your relatives, your family, your children, and so forth? But today, you could do a very complex surgery, a cancer surgery, and you'll be out in two days. 
So doesn't it make more sense to go to a place that really is expert when the data is compelling that they'll do a better job, they'll remove the cancer better, they'll be less complication, and then come back home for your follow-up care? Well, that's the right model, but right now we're stuck on the wrong model. So we've got to kind of change our thinking about volume, about, 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 uh, about who service lines. Some countries are now moving to minimum volume standards. A given hospital is not allowed to provide a procedure or a certain service unless they have a minimum volume standard. I, I, re I would regret having to do that in the US. I think that's a very blunt instrument. But we may have to if we can't get on with some of the outcome measurement and the other things that we need to do to get the system to restructure itself uh, more organically. Uh, because volume really does matter. OK, let's talk very, very quickly about measurement and, and, and payment. And then I'll spend a few seconds on uh, maybe, maybe a minute or two on public policy, and then we'll open it up. Because uh, I, I'm sure I've provoked a few uh, uh, howls of protest here, uh, uh, even though you've been planning not, not to actually howl, even though it's almost Halloween. Uh, so, um, so in terms of measurement, um, this is kind of the measurement uh, universe in healthcare. Uh, these are the things you might want to measure. Uh, patient initial conditions is kind of how sick was the patient, how old, how did they have other problems when they started? Processes are what you do uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the value chain. Uh, indicators are, are, are markers of how you're doing, uh, but they're not actually outcomes. And then outcomes are the actual results. So we've started measuring things in healthcare, but what we're measuring, unfortunately, is almost exclusively processes. What we're doing is we're measuring compliance with guidelines, whether the doctor did what he or she was supposed to do, whether the nursing team did what he or she was supposed to do. Now, do we want to measure processes? Well, all good organizations measure their processes. But the problem is that just measuring the process, particularly in healthcare, is a real trap unless you also measure the outcomes. Because there's a very imperfect connection between process and outcome, and patients are endlessly complicated. So uh, trying to stip stipulate a particular protocol that will apply to everybody is almost impossible. But we've gotten hung up on process measurement. Now, why would we do process measurement, I'm going to ask rhetorically. The answer is it's easy to do process measurement. And you can do process measurement if you're organized in silos, because each silo can measure its own process. Uh, that's why we do process measurement. Measuring outcomes is more complicated, given the discussion I, 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 I shared with you earlier. Uh, that's par part of the reason why we don't do it. But we've got to move away from that. Now, to measure outcomes, um, we have to understand, again, that outcomes are complicated. And I already kind of talked about the idea that there's a hierarchy of outcomes for any medical condition. This is a framework that we've developed over the last two or three years, uh, because there really has been no, no such framework in, in the field to think about you know, what are the outcomes we need to measure. And this slide just gives you an example of how complicated this is. This is breast cancer. These, this, these are the outcomes you probably want to measure. And these are some of the initial conditions or risk factors that you need to capture in order to adjust those outcomes for initial conditions. Now, breast cancer is admittedly a very complicated uh, disease. Some, some others would look a little less scary. But, but you have to measure multiple things. And, and that's been a bit intimidating. Uh, we, we, you know, we often, in cancer, it's quite universal. We always measure survival in cancer. But by and large, that's, what we, that's where we stopped in, in measurement in that particular field. Now, what we've done recently is we've actually proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that we can actually do this, that we can actually measure outcomes. Um, and exhibit A is uh, organ transplantation. Um, Here is a public policy triumph. I knew this would get everybody's attention. Here's a public policy try. Some time ago, because of scandals, we created the National Organ Bank. But some smart Kennedy School leadership fellow, I hope, <laughs> figured out that if we were going to allocate organs, why not make a requirement that if you got an organ, you had to report your outcomes? So it's mandatory that everybody in America that does an organ transplantation of any type has to report certain outcomes. And this is one of those outcomes, one year graft survival. So in the case of kidney, that's is the kidney, the transplanted kidney functioning after a year. And this was the data, the first year that the data was published. 
87 to 89. And all of these dots are centers that do kidney transplantation in the United States of America. And there were 219 of them. Now, uh, again, here's another example of fragmentation. That's too many. Look at how many centers did less than 50 cases in three years. Okay? This is the problem of fragmentation. Every hospital, to be cool, to be prestigious, feels like they have to have a transplant team and heart transplant team, and they can be on the news, and you know, it's very exciting. But, but, but you need a certain amount of volume to really have a team, a kidney team. And a lot of these centers don't. Now, these yellow and, and red uh, 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 dots, are, are those reflect risk adjustment. So you think that, wow, this is complicated. How could we avoid biasing outcomes because patients are so different. Well, they've got a, they've got a very well accepted system of regression analysis and, and, the, and the red dots are the centers that did better than expected given their patient mix. And the yellow dots are the pa centers that did worse than expected given their patient mix. And you can see that there's not many reds and yellows. That's because of statistics. Because unless you have a number of data points, you, you know, you can't reliably argue that one is better than expected or worse than expected. Now, for the typical tra traditional medical thinking, if you don't have statistical validity, you shouldn't do it. And of course, what we believe and what we know is that we have to do it. And whether it's statistically valid doesn't matter. We've got to measure those outcomes. We've got to track them over time. We've got to see if we're getting better. We've got to understand the patients that don't do well. And we've got to figure out which other centers do a good job. Outcome measurement is not for us, the consumer. Outcome measurement is for the doctors and their teams. That's who it's really for. And there's been many examples around the world where it's not made public, but boy, there's been a lot of impact just from the measuring process. Now, let's, now here's, here's what makes you so enthusiastic about the future of healthcare. I'm going to show you the data from the most recent three-year data cut that is available for the same metric and the same uh, condition. That's what happened once we started measuring outcomes. Uh, the, the average outcome got better, but even more importantly, the distribution tightened. We still can't prove who's necessarily better. This is not a tournament. You know, it's not baseball. It, it, it's, about, it's about being able to kind of see how you're doing. Why did these numbers improve so much? Because by first, for the first time ever, People actually knew where to look to figure out how to get better. In healthcare, it's legendary for how slow the diffusion of innovation is. The, the typical number that people use in healthcare takes 17 years for a proven concept to get used by the majority of providers. And that's because there's no outcome measurement. Everybody's just kind of, everybody thinks that they're above average. And oh my gosh, I'm up to date. I do it well. But when you have outcome measurement, you have this, this market for ideas and, 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 look, and look at the improvement, even for one of the most complex medical problems uh, you know, on the face of the earth, is, is dealing with these organ transplants and all the rejection and all that sort of thing. This is what we can achieve everywhere if we start doing this. Okay? We've got to start measuring outcomes. Uh, the Swedes are the best at it. Swedes have national quality registries with very high levels of compliance in many, many areas. These are just some of them uh, we don't have time to discuss it. On cost, I've kind of given you the, the big messages. Uh, in order to understand cost, we've got to measure it the right way. Um, uh, and I'm actually doing a, a study now with Professor Kaplan, Robert Kaplan at HBS, where we're really sort of thinking about how to redefine cost accounting in, in healthcare. And I'm very, very excited about what we're going to be able to accomplish there. A few quick words on pricing, and then we'll turn to uh, public policy. Uh, I said before that uh, the right model is not fee-for-service. It's not global budgeting, which is to give a hospital a certain budget and say, spend the money, and then you're done. Some countries have tried that. You know what happens? You know, on, on the 27th of the month, <laughs> they turn off the lights. They're done. Uh, and when they, after they do the 21st budgeted knee surgery, then they're done. 
uh, and that doesn't work either. Uh, global capitation I already talked about. What's the bundle model? Here's an example of a bundle pricing model that's actually in operation in the county of Stockholm in, in Sweden. Uh, and what the bundle is is that everything in the yellow box is covered. You can see, and, and by the way, this is the doctor's fees, the facilities charges, everything. So the pre-op evaluation, lab test, radiology, surgery, prosthesis, drugs, all of that stuff. A good bundle uh, also creates responsibility for avoidable complications. So that if there's an avoidable complication, the provider is responsible for dealing with that out of whatever they've already been paid. They don't get more. Okay? And in this case, there's a two-year warranty for a reoperation, and then there's a five-year warranty on infections. Okay? Now, um, this is functioning. It's covered thousands of patients. There's been no crisis, no catastrophe in moving to this system. Uh, the number that most of my uh, clinician friends are very interested in is the number on the lower right-hand corner. Uh, some of you can't see it. You know what the bundle price is in Sweden for a total knee or a total joint? It's 8,000 US dollars. Okay, now you, two, you all are too young. You don't know anybody that's had one of these. But in the US, it's going to be twenty-five to $40,000. Okay? And yet, and Sweden's not a cheap place. I mean, it's not a place that's, you know, you go if you have a budget vacation plan. You know, you, uh, you know uh, Sweden's expensive, but they, are, they can do this for $8,000, all included. And their doctors get paid a decent wage. Uh, and this, this shows you how big the opportunity is in healthcare. Uh, how big the... How, how we, how we could do so much better, how we could create so much better outcomes, and how we could do it so much more efficiently. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and this is the opportunity that we're now starting to see happen. In the US now, there are many bundle pricing uh, pilots going on and experiments. We're learning how to do this. It, it, it takes some complicated, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a little more complicated than just paying the same old way, but we'll, we'll get it done. Hopefully, we'll get it done. In terms of, of integrating, Facilities. How do we tie facilities together? How do we put the right services in the right facility? How do we avoid doing primary care in the Brigham and Women's Hospital down on Francis Street? How do we avoid doing simple surgeries in Mass General's precious operating rooms? You know, uh, how, do, how do we get the right service in the right place? How do we avoid duplication? All those things are huge cost reduction opportunities that come from systems integration. Uh, how do we how do we proliferate this example, which is the Cleveland Clinic I mentioned earlier? Cleveland Clinic, obviously, the mother church is in Cleveland. Uh, but the Cleveland Clinic actually does heart surgery in, uh, in four, uh, five other locations that they don't own in most cases, where they have an affiliation. And where they, 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 the physicians work for the Cleveland Clinic, the surgeons, they are measured by the clinic, they're trained by the clinic, the clinic does the billing, the clinic does everything. So you can get Cleveland Clinic heart surgery in Cape Fear Valley Health System in North Carolina. <laughs> and what they found is they can get Cape Fear Valley Healthcare System up to Cleveland Clinic quality and value standards very quickly. Except for the most complicated cases, in which case they will recommend that they go to the mother church, where you have somebody that does so many complicated cases that they don't seem complicated anymore. Uh, that's the future of healthcare delivery. And we're starting to see these affiliations pop up and bubble up uh, throughout the system as community hospitals understand they, they shouldn't try to reinvent the wheel. Why reinvent the wheel? Why not go and work with the best? Why not affiliate? That's, that's the way this market should work. IT, uh, again, I won't spend much time, but IT has a there's, a, there's a set of standards that we have to achieve in terms of IT if we're going to enable all of this. And, uh, here we have uh, Harvard uh, is, is, is deeply ensconced in this issue because David Blumenthal is heading up the IT effort in Washington. I think this is probably the best part of the Obama administration healthcare approach. This is the area where they've done the best work, where they're making the most rapid progress uh, is in IT. So that's an area where I'm cautiously optimistic that we're already on the right track. But in the other areas, we have a long way to go. Okay, well, let's finally talk about government. What does government need to do? 
And I think if I all ask you to write down on, your, on paper in front of you what government needed to do, I would hope that in an audience like this, you could have made this slide. Uh, because I think it falls out pretty clearly if you know what the real problem is. Number one is outcome measure. That inherently is a function where government has to play because we want the same standards, the same metrics all across the country. Okay? We need government to play there. Uh, and we need to create a reporting structure that's fair and open. Like in transplant. In transplant, those outcomes are reported by an organization called UNOS. Uh, on, there's a website. You can go look at it. It's not so user friendly, but, but you can figure it out. Uh, number two, we got to shift reimbursement, and Medicare has to take the lead. Because if Medicare does it, uh, others will do it. Um, but if Medicare isn't fast enough, we've got to go ahead and have the private sector do it too. And, and it's already happening. Uh, here the question is accelerating something that's starting to happen. But we've got to make sure that we don't get tripped up on the wrong reimbursement model and go back to that global capitation thing. Because that is going to be unfortunate. Uh, that'll, that'll create a mess. Number three, we've got to remove obstacles to integrating care and coming up with the right care delivery model. Right now, for example, we have something called the Stark Laws. You may have heard of them. And they're designed to prevent conflict of interest. So if you're a neurologist, uh, you know, you're not allowed to refer uh, uh, one of your patients to an affiliated imaging center. Does that sound smart? Well, you could see why you want, didn't want people to have financial interest and, and do bad things. But actually, in integrated care models, we want people to refer within their team and actually to work as a team. So we've got to, we've got to tinker with some of these laws, anti-kickback rules. Uh, right now, the doctors and, and the hospital are paid separately. And it's illegal for the hospital to share any of its payment with the doctors in order to kind of make everything fair for everybody if, if they reorganize care. And we've got to change those laws. Corporate practice of medicine. In many states, it's illegal to hire a doctor as an employee. So doctors are free agents. They're independent of the hospital. That makes it almost impossible to, to build integrated care process. So we've got to, we've got to do that. Opening competition. Uh, among providers so that there's real choice. Uh, uh, encouraging the involvement of patients in, in their care uh, and setting good IT standards and rolling out IT. These, I think, are the, the big six in terms of public policy. I think in terms of where we are now in America, we're pretty good on the last one in terms of IT. I think the bill made some progress on the next to last one in terms of uh, providing for patient responsibility allowing uh, various ways of encouraging that. Uh, uh, the bill was pretty much silent on you know, one, two, three, and four. Uh, it doesn't eliminate the possibility that those things will happen, but it simply didn't forcefully attack any of those issues. So this is, I, in my view anyway, this is the problem of health care. Uh, this is where we have to go. This is where we have to get. Uh, it's complicated. It's a significant shift in the paradigm and the organizational model. Why would I possibly be optimistic that this could actually happen? Why would I be optimistic if it hasn't happened before? Well, the answer is, uh, there's a number of answers. Number one, it already is happening. It's happening organically. It's bubbling up in the system. We have dozens and dozens of cases at the business school about organizations that are doing this. We see it all over the world. It's happening. It's still 5%. It's not 10%. It's not 15%. It's still 5%, but it's moving very rapidly. Secondly, everybody now in the system is scared, really scared, particularly the provider community. Uh, they're just sure as they can be that there's going to be draconian reimbursement cuts. So even organizations like Partners that you have had so much clout that they could just kind of shed, not even worry about whatever happened, they were going to be fine, are talking about significant cost reductions. And you can't make significant cost reductions without these structural changes. 
And that's what I think we've proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. So I think what we're seeing is more and more organizations moving in this direction, more will, and it's a kind of a self-reinforcing process. Once the ball gets rolling, I think it'll start rolling fairly quickly. So uh, here's a point of view about healthcare delivery. Here's a sense for what government needs to do. Uh, Mary Jo, I think, has asked, I'll just handle the Q&A, but, but let me now open it up and let's fire away and have a discussion. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Let, let's start down here with... I'm Mona Kandar from India, and I have been working in health sector uh, for more than two years. Now, um, what you have presented, I think it's not limited only to the USA, but it has got a significant um, spillover effects in developing countries right. and um, poor countries also. Yep. Because they are being advised like that. Yep. Uh, what they are doing wrong here. Yep. Uh, same wrong advice. Same wrong. Yeah. yeah. So I think uh, um, for the international community as well, mm -hmm. they need to be aware about this fact. Great. Thank you. Well, I agree. We have something at Harvard called the Global Health Delivery Project. And before he left Harvard, uh, Dr. Jim Kim, who, who is now at Dartmouth, uh, actually uh, persuaded me to uh, work with him and Paul Farmer and others on sort of taking these concepts and, and, and really trying to develop them further for a developing country context. So there are articles on this. There are case studies. We'd be happy to share them to you. Uh, by the way, uh, maybe I'll go back to the, the very first slide here. Uh, down here in the small print, I guess there's no slide. Th there's a website uh, we have called uh, at the Institute for Strategy and Competitiveness, isc.hbs.edu, on which you can find all of all the stuff you could possibly want to see on 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 on, on advanced economy healthcare, on, on global health delivery. But but we have very much. Uh, uh, done that, and, and we believe that you have to change, you know, some issues that you have to deal that are different in a, in a poor country, uh, and uh, so we've tried to work on that. But uh, you're, thanks for the question. Uh, let's see, who's next? Um, right here in the middle. Yes, thank you. Please, by the way, yeah, tell me who you are. If you're a doctor, I want to know. If you're, if you're a litigator doing malpractice litigation, I want to know. Hey. Great. And one thing I'm curious about that I don't feel like I ever heard people mention is when you think about how many of our costs we're incurring come from the fact that we now have the ability to keep people with chronic diseases alive for so much longer. My question is, why don't people discuss putting some more funds into research that we feel secure? Is it because big pharma is completely against cure? Because we're good cover because our patient populations and instant gratification but would that not solve a lot of our, the monetary crisis? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's well understood that, uh, you know, preventative uh, care is good uh, and that we should do much, much better in preventative care. It's been poorly reimbursed. Uh, it's been organized in a way that, as I said, is not very effective. Um, uh, and, and I can tell you that chronic disease is where a lot of the money goes because there's so many customers, you know. Uh, so I actually think the problem in the United States is, is not so much the medical science and the research. I think we're doing pretty well there. We got a lot of good stuff. The, the problem is really on the delivery side and the inefficiency of the delivery side. And um, I think we want medical science to keep allowing us to deal more and better with everything. You know, we, we, we don't want to stop the bus. But see, what's happened is the cost gets higher and higher and higher because we haven't tackled these issues of value. And therefore, we start getting worried that I mean, we don't want the newest generation of MRI because that's just going to make things worse, even if the newest generation actually works. So uh, I, I think that, that, that I wouldn't put the blame on, on pharma uh, or any other uh, supplier industry. I, I would say that they can do a lot better. Uh, they've been playing the game that you know, we've created. Uh, and, uh, you know, for example, right now, uh, many cancer drugs uh, get used uh, uh, very frequently, but they only work for 10% of the patients that use them. And, uh, uh, and, and, and that's a problem of delivery. 
uh, that we're not getting the right, the right, the right drug to the right patient. Uh, and uh, that's partly because we're not willing to spend the money kind of developing the diagnostics to kind of understand which drug will work with what patient. And uh, so I, I, I don't think we should try to control science to reduce cost. I, I think we need to reorganize delivery. And, uh, you know, I, I have a very deep conviction that we could deliver the outcomes we do today uh, for 50% of the cost. That's how big it is. And imagine what if happens if we went from 17% of GDP to 8.5% of GDP. All of a sudden, it wouldn't seem so scary that we could tackle another disease. And uh, you know, uh, right now we are in a very bad place because we're, we're so inefficient and the cost is so high that we that we feel like we're at the breaking point. And, and that's a very bad place to be. I mean, the UK has been more like that. You know, the UK has been very much oriented. We can't afford this, so how can we decide whether? this 85-year-old should get the hip or not, you know, whether it's worth it. Um, I, I believe, you know, there's a lot of talk now about doing comparative effectiveness and proving that, you know, a drug is worth it in terms of extending life. Um, I, I get very nervous about that whole mindset. I, I would rather see us focus on value improvement. And I think we can improve value a lot, and I think, it, I think there'll be a, it'll be a long time before we have to make these awful choices about who deserves the care and who will get enough benefit to justify the expense. I think that's, that's a very difficult discussion for Americans to have. And I don't think we need to have it if we can have a discussion about these issues. Uh, OK, yes, sir, here in the blue, uh, blue blazer. Well, thank you for your talk. Um, uh, my name is Toph Peabody. I'm a former uh, Zuckerman fellow. I uh, did my MPH here. And I'm, uh, Great emergency medicine physician at uh, LA County resident Great. physician. Um, <laughs> so still in training. Still training. Uh, I, my question, and I'm not in primary care, but my question was related to your uh, comments on primary care, the medical home model. Mm -hmm. um, the, the model that was proposed is, you know, if you have diabetes, you go to the diabetes doctor, and if you have a hip replacement, you go to the hip replacement doctor. And I think that's great for people to become great, really good and proficient in one procedure, and I think that's more efficient, you've proved that. But what about the patient that has, you know, the diabetes, the hip, and the and the coronary artery disease, and the other thing? I think that's what the medical home kind of does, mm -hmm. is that it is able to kind of take that complex patient, so that they are coming in on their meds to the emergency room with a certain thing, where then I can plug them into the guy that does a great mm -hmm. hip procedure. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I do. So uh, I just wanted to know kind of what your model sure. would be for, you know, great. the complexities. Of that. For, for, okay, so first of all, let me emphasize, we, 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 we need to keep the primary care. The primary care is the generalist. The primary care is the, um, the kind of way that, that ho hopefully you, you connect the dots across various problems. Um, we need, though, to change the way we do primary care uh, to allow the primary care teams to reflect the circumstances of the patients they're caring for. So if we got somebody with five diseases or six diseases, we need a different kind of primary care with more time, more resources, more support, more coordination than if we got a healthy adult coming in for their annual physical and their flu shots. Uh, uh, so, that, that, so we want to keep primary care. You, you caught another key point, which is we want then the primary care uh, organization to start having relationships and affiliations with these integrated units to deal with whatever problem is identified. And if there are multiple problems, think of how much easier coordination is. If you're coordinating between your integrated cardiac organization and your integrated diabetes organization, then if you're coordinating between 500 bubbles, uh, that, that have no links with each other. So I think we're much better off, even with the most complex patients, uh, in a structure like this. Um, and, um, um, and I think that, um, again, let me just say something I said earlier, which may be more relevant and meaningful now. In, in healthcare, we can't organize around the exception. We have to organize the stuff that we know needs to happen for a given problem. We need to organize around that. Uh, and then the unusual stuff, which is the patient with a hip fracture, cardiac disease, and cancer, then we need to create sort of an overlay structure to deal with that. Uh, and the problem is that, that we've, we've gotten backwards. 
And as a result, we've created a lot of waste and, and inefficiency and, and, and poor outcomes. So um, uh, now the medical home idea, you're making it seem like we know what this is. There is no medical home. This is, this is the theory. And the core of the medical home theory is care coordination. And what we've got to work out is, is what the real medical home that we really want should look like. Because if all we have is just some poor harried person trying to connect the bubbles, uh, it's not going to amount to much. That, that's my opinion anyway. I, I, you, know, you, you, you didn't ask me the question I was afraid you would ask, which is how do I think about emergency medicine? Because see, emergency medicine is another one of those things where you got all this stuff coming in the door and it's, it's highly variable. And you know you might have a stroke patient, you might have somebody with a with a broken you know toe. And or, or emergency medicine has the the problem of how to organize to deal with all that stuff fairly efficiently. I think what we're learning in emergency medicine is first of all let's segregate the hard ones from the easy ones, and then among the hard ones for the things that require a lot of coordination, let's have a stroke team. Uh, so I think emergency medicine, in in a funny way, has embraced more of these principles than, than, than much of healthcare. So uh, I, I'm sure it can be improved, but, but I think it's, I think it's uh, been moving in that direction. Oh, uh, one more says uh, the boss. Yes, sir, in the back with a blue shirt. So my name's Jake Greenberg. I'm a surgeon. Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> so I do a lot of obesity surgery. Yep. I work in a weight center, which is set up a lot like what you're describing. So we right. have diabetologists, we have surgeons, we have medical doctors, we have physical therapists, nutritionists, psychologists, everyone to take care of every sort of problem that we could come up with for our obese patients, which is one of the major health concerns in America right yep. now. Our program, because we're so structured and so well-defined, we have great outcomes, but we're a high-cost program, so insurances charge our patients a higher copay to come see us rather than our competition who has none of that. Mm -hmm. So until you fix, how do you fix that problem? How do you yep. get the payers to get on the same page as yep. you and we are? Well, it's, it's again a problem that, that I have stressed, but I think you've just accented the problem. Um, you know, um, let me go, uh, if I can find it quickly, let's go to my, uh, this slide. The reason that your competitors are lower cost is that as you spread these things out, you kind of spread out the payment. But the cost of spreading out the payment is the patient is kind of suffering. Because they go to the PCP, they wait for two months, they hope it's going to be better, it's not better, then they go back, then they go back, then they go back. What you're doing is you're pulling cost up front and, and, and doing it right and getting the outcomes. But our system is so ridiculous that the payer doesn't understand that that's a great value. Uh, because the payers often have this mindset, oh, my patients are going to, my subscribers are going to leave and there'll be turnover. Actually, there isn't as much turnover as they say. But it's just the way they think. So we do have to, payment reform has to be part of this equation. What I would suggest you do is if you have a, a, pri a lot of private practice uh, uh, clients, uh, go directly to the employer. Go find the large employers in your, in your community and talk to them. They're going to get it. They're going to get it because what they care about is the, the health. They're going to have to pay the bill anyway. Uh, the health plan, you know, health plans get, uh, get a, a, a margin on top of the, uh, what they pay to the doctors and you guys. So what's their incentive? More. So it's, it's, a, it's a perverse system, but now I hope we all understand this is the real problem. And, you know, saying that a medical home is going to solve the problem is not going to solve it. Saying that an accountable care organization is going to, it's not, we have to get at the guts here of, of care delivery. We've got to get at the measurement. We've got to get the payment. And, and, I, and I'm confident we will because we have to. And I think the system is awakened. But, but you're raising, it's an excellent point. And I'd love, we'd love to hear more about what you're doing, just because we're, we document these examples, they're precious. Everywhere we can find them, we grab them. So, uh, so thank you. Well, Mary Jo, thanks well, for that. Uh, well, you've given us an enormous amount of
system, and it must. Um, and we've not got a healthcare system that's designed to deliver value. In fact, quite the contrary. Um, I, I, I would say that I'm extremely optimistic about the ability to make epic improvements in healthcare delivery. Uh, but if we're going to do that, we're going to have to think very differently about, about the problem. We're going to have to think very differently about the solutions. Um, and that's what I'd like to do today. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, how would we actually create a high value healthcare delivery system? How would we actually create a system that could relentlessly, rapidly improve value? Uh, that's the real question I think we have to answer. And if we can understand that, if we can understand what kind of healthcare delivery system we want, uh, then we can start to set the right public policies that are going to get us uh, in the right direction. So how do we think about uh, value? How do we think about the, the goal of, of, of creating value in the healthcare delivery system? Well, I think the, the first conclusion that I reached, and this was now quite some years ago after the first uh, wave of work in, in healthcare. This is very echoey to me. Is it echoey to you? No. No? Good. Okay. Well, I'll, 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 I'll suck it up and go ahead. Um, <laughs> So uh, what I realized was that if we're going to create a high value system, uh, we can't do it incrementally. This is a very, very tough thing to have to say. Uh, uh, if we make incremental improvement, but we don't attack the actual underlying structure of the system that we have today, I've come to believe that we will never be very happy with the results. Because the healthcare delivery system that we have today is a system that's been built up over a long period. There's a legacy here. And the way hospitals look, and the way doctors practice medicine, and the way nurses and teams provide care, that, that, there's a legacy structure. And that structure, I think, is deeply flawed. Now, we can make things better with incremental improvement. For example, let's take an example of safety. In this very building, Don Berwick used to, you know, used to have his office here, and he's been raising the issue of safety, medical errors. And we can indeed introduce safety programs into healthcare delivery organizations, and if we do, that'll make things better. Uh, but unfortunately, if we don't change the structure of the delivery system, uh, we won't be able to move it very far. Let's take another example. Let's take process guidelines or, or pathways <coughs> of care. A lot of focus in healthcare about designing protocols and pathways uh, to deliver care for giving medical problems uh, better. And, and many organizations do design these protocols and design these pathways. But if we leave the structure the same, if we, if we have a structure that, that, that is dysfunctional, it's very hard for actually those pathways to be implemented. Even if we got the right pathway, it doesn't actually get used in practice. So the point here is that we've got to step back. We can't assume that, uh, that, that, that the problem here is one that we can solve incrementally. We've got to step back and ask ourselves uh, much more basic questions about the underlying structure of the system. And that's what we've been trying to do in, in this body of work. I guess the final sort of framing question here is what should the role of the market be in healthcare? Uh, this is, of course, a fiercely debated issue all around the world. Some people think, oh, there's no room for the market in healthcare. Other people think the market's the only way to save healthcare. And of course, this is an, an issue of great uh, interest to me because I'm a strategy professor. You know, I do markets. And, uh, um, but what I've come to understand is the problem is not whether we use the market or not. Uh, in fact, I think in general, we would want to use the market. The market means people have choice. And I think most people would agree that patients should have choice. And if patients have choice, there's a market mechanism underway. Uh, but the problem, the, the, the problem we've had in healthcare is not whether we have the market or not. It's how the market has been constructed. And the unfortunate problem we have right now, particularly in the US, is that the way the market works is actually not aligned with value for the patient. The competition is one where financial success for the various participants of the system is not equal to patient success. You can have system participants succeed without the patient succeeding. And in that situation, we, 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 the market starts to make things worse and not better. And that's the fix that we're in in healthcare. The market has been actually working against us in terms of value improvement because people aren't rewarded for value improvement. 
The market has been leading mostly to zero-sum competition, where we're essentially trying So what I'd like to talk about today is a, a very uh, complicated subject, uh, which uh, we, we constantly try to make simple. And every time we make it simple, we mess it up even more. Uh, because uh, this subject of healthcare is not a sound bite. Uh, there is no silver bullet. Um, um, and uh, if we're going to really attack uh, the question of healthcare, and if we're going to be su successful in addressing the question of healthcare, I think we actually have, have to have a fairly deep <coughs> understanding of the problem. And so what I'm going to try to do today, which is not a good idea because it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday, I'm going to try to give you a really deep understanding of the problem. And uh, I'm going to talk too fast, uh, but I'm going to show you a bunch of slides. These slides will post and make available to anybody who's interested. I, I'm going to get to public policy because I know everybody here likes public policy, uh, but I'm going to get there slowly. Because I think unless we understand the actual nitty gritty of healthcare delivery, um, and what the real problem is, uh, we, can, we get our public policy wrong. So I'm going to overweight the what's going on here and how do we think about it, and, and we'll talk a little bit about policy at the end. I'm going to work to the best of my ability to leave plenty of time at the end for discussion. Uh, we are, in fact, a little bit programmed about how much we talk. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best to violate you know, that, that, that programming a little bit. Uh, but I, I do want to give you a, a serious uh, discussion here. And I, and I hope this is not too heavy uh, for this case. But uh, I, I, the, one of the reasons I, I wanted to come today is because all of you actually can do something about this in one way or another. Uh, there's some people in, in this audience that work in healthcare. Obviously, you have the most direct impact, but almost all of us has some levers that we can use to, to influence this, and uh, so hopefully you will. So, what's the problem of healthcare? Uh, I mean, the first part of the problem of healthcare is to get access coverage, and uh, uh, obviously, without people getting access to care, without coverage, uh, ultimately we'll never have a successful system. Um, but what I've been focusing on is uh, not the access problem, um, uh, because I think we understand the access problem pretty well. And some, many countries have solved the access problem. Uh, what I've been working on is really, the, I think, the more basic problem, and that's the delivery problem, uh, the way we actually deliver health care. Access is not the goal of health care. Access is just the start of the real goal, which is uh, to deliver good care. Uh, and uh, in fact, I would say that the, the real goal of healthcare is value. How, how do we actually deliver good value? How do we actually get good patient outcomes uh, per dollar we spend in uh, trying to achieve those outcomes? Um, and and w what I'd like to uh, argue is that we really haven't thought about value as the central goal in healthcare. Uh, it's not been the goal that's united all of us uh, and all the actors in the system.